Hello, everyone. My name is Lynn Dominguez, and Paul Klonowski and I would like to welcome you to our presentation about canoeing magic, function, and style. So to get started, we'd like to think about all those canoes that have been purchased over the course of the last year during the pandemic to the point where canoe shops can't even keep them in place and in stock. So we're wondering whether a lot of those people have bought canoes, and maybe you're some of them, and are now having trouble making their canoes go straight or thinking about planning some journeys. So if you join us today, we are going to reveal some of this canoeing magic to make your journey in canoe a little bit better and less frustrating. So when we start our journey, we want to make sure that we have a meeting of the minds, yours and your canoe. So let's think about some of these issues that could be starting with your canoe journey. First of all, we know that canoeing is a whole lot more fun if you can actually make the canoe go straight. And many of you have had maybe had the problem where you got in your canoe, maybe with your paddling partner, if you're paddling tandem, and that darn canoe just wouldn't go straight. Or maybe you are finding that you want to be able to turn the canoe rather than letting the canoe be in control because maybe it's been turning the wrong way or you had experience like mine with my first canoe where it tended to go towards the bank all the time on the little river I was paddling. Sometimes you end your canoe journey in a day and you're exhausted. Well, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen anymore. And we'll have some key hints and tips to make sure that you stop being so tired at the end of your day. And, and you can also want to make sure that you can slide past a rock or a branch without turning broadside to a current if you're in a river or that wind. So you want to be in control of the canoe on a windy lake. And you do that through learning some different techniques and some different strokes. So maybe you're saying, yes, that's how I want my canoe to behave. How do I get there? Well, we have some keys to a successful canoe journey that hopefully will help that um, happen, that you can make your canoe behave. So the first of these is that canoeing is not intuitive. And I know that some of you that live in the Midwest, that might come as a surprise because everybody knows that if you live in the Midwest, canoeing is in your genes. Now, my husband is from California and I was always worried about him when he first got into the canoe that he might not know what to do. But what I found out is that both of us could use some help. Also, you probably already know some things that in canoeing and you can build on those that you already know about and hopefully you're not starting from scratch. Sometimes though, it means that you have to unlearn some things that you already learned that maybe your grandfather taught you or your big brother taught you or your mom when they first took you out in the canoe. But we wanna be able to build on some of the things you already know. Also, it's always helpful to get some instruction. And we're gonna talk about where you can go to get some instruction in the United States and to really have a better experience. And finally, it's always important to choose the right canoe that makes for more fun, right? So we're gonna give you some tips and hints towards choosing that right canoe that makes it more fun. So as we continue our journey in canoeing magic, first of all, let's address this idea that canoeing is not intuitive. One of the things that you have to remember is that there's lots of outside forces acting on your canoe. The water, is acting on it, whether it's moving or not in a, in a current or in the wind. The paddle, every time you put your paddle in the water, your canoe is going to respond to that. The paddler always makes a difference in how you are sitting in the canoe, how you shift your weight. All of those things have an effect on the canoe. And it's hard to remember when you're in the middle of a windy lake that you need to relax and that you need to use your paddle to have better effect on which way the canoe goes. I will tell you that frustration is normal. Everybody that starts a new skill has some level of frustration. Nobody is an expert. But I will also say that yelling 
by the stern paddler at the bow paddler is not allowed. And many times as an instructor, I split up couples so that they have a chance to learn away from some of the learned communication problems that they're having. Also remember everyone starts out as a beginner. Maybe you've been seeing these amazing freestyle videos on YouTube and you're like, how do people do that? I'll never be able to do that. All those people started out as a beginner. Also, it's important not to try and rush the process, but also to go slow when you get in your canoe and feel the water on the paddle and feel how the canoe moves. And sometimes it's helpful to try a solo canoe. But mainly, I just want you to give yourself some grace and some time to learn and realize that after a hard day paddling and learning new things, when you sleep on it, sometimes it's better the next day. Secondly, we wanna build on what you already know. Many of you may have already learned lots of things about canoeing. And so one of the first things that we need to do in this journey is make sure that we clean up all the strokes and maneuvers that you already know. So lots of times we'll start out with a forward stroke to make sure that we are going in the direction that we want, that we understand the main keys to the forward stroke, which includes stacked hands, one on top of the other, a vertical paddle shaft, and a relatively short stroke that doesn't go beyond your hip. So that's why we say that sometimes learning in the solo canoe is a good place to start because only you are having an effect on that canoe and not your partner. So we start with those cleanup of strokes and take you what you already know and use that to build upon your skills. We really want to add some grace and efficiency for the paddle going through the water and a feel for the water. So that's a, again, another reason why we ask you to go slow. There are some very specific building blocks for learning how to canoe. The first of these is the forward stroke because we spend most of our time going forward. That's the idea. We wanna go see cool things um, along the shoreline or down the river. Then we need to learn some correction strokes. So how do we get started going forward in a straight line and then keep going forward with the use of different types of strokes such as a J stroke or a rudder? And then we wanna throw in some turning strokes. So what happens if we see this great beaver dam that we wanna go, go over towards? How do we turn the canoe so that it gets there? And sometimes the key to going straight is to actually use some of these turning strokes. And then finally, sometimes we have to back up. So we need to go in reverse. And that's especially important on a river where we always wanna go either faster or slower than the current. We want the, us to be in control of the canoe and not the river. Once we've learned all these different strokes and we're able to do them efficiently and with some grace, then we also want to combine them into our different maneuvers. So we're gonna do some combinations of strokes that are linked together. And that's really what freestyle is when you see people doing those freestyle maneuvers is just a combination of the strokes that you already know. Okay, so why bother with instruction? As in Lynn indicated, canoeing is not intuitive. Nobody was born with a paddle in their hand. Becky Mason was not born with a paddle in her hand. She may have gotten one in her hand a little earlier than most, but she was not born that way. Also, instruction has changed. Not only the instruction techniques, but some of the canoe techniques have changed as well. Before I took my first formal canoe class, I thought I was a pretty good canoeist. I'd been in Boy Scouts, we'd been on family trips, my dad taught us stuff, and I had about a thousand miles of Canadian wilderness trips in my back pocket. How could I not be a good canoeist? Well, we didn't get very far into that class when, to be honest, I was blown away by how much differently the instructor's canoe worked as opposed to mine. And they were the exact same model canoe. What I was doing worked, yes, but I was muscling my way through everything, not only to get the canoe to go straight, but to get it to turn where and when I wanted it to. The instructor made everything happen with minimal effort. She literally just dipped her paddle into the water and the canoe did exactly what she said it would do. The amount of effort expended was dramatically less than I was doing and it achieved more. That is the very definition of efficiency. 
You're doing more with less effort. Less effort means less pain, and it means you're less tired at the end of the day. Okay, so where do you start then? I would start by buying a canoe from a, a shop that offers lessons. Chances are they're selling better quality canoes, especially in terms of materials and hull design than a shop that does not offer lessons. The, the better shop wants you to enjoy the canoe and wants you to be a repeat customer. The big box store just wants to sell you a boat. And in my area, at least, they literally don't care whether you survive your first day out in it. If they don't offer lessons, shop elsewhere. And then take advantage of those lessons. You'll learn more in a one day lesson than I did in a thousand miles of wilderness canoe tripping. You may find the shop's scheduled lessons may not fit your schedule very well. Ask if private lessons are an option. They'll be more expensive than group lessons, but then ask of if you can bring your friends or your kids, make it a group lesson. Your canoe store is your resource. They want to work with you. And maybe you wanna take your skills to a level beyond what they offer. There are more options out there. Immersing yourself in three days of canoe lessons is a great way to build muscle memory so the skills are harder to forget. The Wisconsin Sym Canoe Symposium is an hour up north of Madison. The Adirondack Symposium is in way upstate New York. The Midwest Symposium is just an hour, a little bit south of, of Cleveland, about four hours from East Lansing. These three events focus on lake skills with some river classes usually available depending on water levels. The Pine Barrens Functional Canoe Workshop focuses on applying those, all the skills in moving water. One participant from these events gave this feedback. You must have swapped my boat for one that behaves. You can also visit freestylecanoeing.com and find an instructor and then talk about setting up a one day clinic in your area. We do one of these in Illinois. We're looking for a good site in lower Michigan and that can spread to your area at your request. Okay, so let's talk about buying a canoe. First thing I wanna point out is that making an informed choice is critical. Taking your first lesson before you buy will give you some knowledge that will help you make a more informed choice. The most expensive canoe is the one that is really cheap and is no fun to paddle and turns itself into a lawn ornament. That's just an old adage that we have. The more fun you have paddling that boat, the more you're gonna paddle it. The right boat for you depends on, well, you. What will you be doing with this boat? Will you be on small protected lakes, larger lakes where wind is a factor, slow, gentle creeks, faster moving water, white water? Well, a white water canoe is not a very good beginner boat, I'll tell you that. Different canoes are designed for different purposes. Let's remember that. Some canoes are marketed as it does everything well. What that means is it does everything well enough for some folks, but isn't really the best choice for any one use. All these factors listed, how are you gonna use the canoe? Canoe camping, where you take five days worth of stuff down a river or on a boundary waters trip? Are you gonna use it for day paddles where you don't really need to take a lot of stuff? Are you gonna be fishing where you want a really stable boat? A river canoe is different than a lake canoe. Are you gonna be racing in your canoe? A racing canoe is another poor choice for a beginner boat. Are you interested in an interpretive freestyle boat? These are all decisions you have to make. Do you want a solo or a tandem boat or both? Also, you need to include picnic supplies. How many kids, how many people, how many dogs, water bottles, fishing tackle, everything else that you're gonna be bringing with you. How heavy are you willing to pick up on this canoe? You have to load it onto your car, remember. One thing that is true is that canoes get heavier as we get older. Lighter weight canoes cost more than heavier ones is another sad statement, but it's 
you're buying much more expensive uh, materials, much more durable materials, and there's some added uh, labor cost in building them too. This is true for all small boats. You need to define your balance between budget and weight. Finding a demo day not too far from you is a great opportunity to test paddle a lot of different boats. A test paddle store is a great place. Don't buy a boat before you test paddle it. It's gonna sound redundant, I know, but if the store doesn't allow test paddling, take your money someplace else. Putting your canoe in the water for the first time is always a special day. Having taken that lesson before you even bought the canoe means you're less likely to dump the boat when you first step into it, which is a good thing. Practice those skills. Take that canoe to your lake or your river, wherever you're going. Use it or lose it applies here. If life gets in the way, try to arrange for a remedial coaching session to refresh those skills. It'll help bring those skills back into top form. Here's what good canoeing skills look like in real life. As you watch this short video, take note of how little effort the paddlers put into executing the various maneuvers. You can paddle like this all day and not get tired, or sore for that matter.
Okay, so this is what you wanted to know about. This is why you're here. You want to know about that big secret to freestyle canoeing. And the secret is, there is no secret. You need to develop that understanding of how the canoe works and you'll be well on your way to wherever you want to go. Once you understand that your body, your boat, and your paddle are all connected, it just opens up being able to use the relative motion of the water to achieve amazing things with your canoe. The easy part, the, people, the part that a lot of folks don't realize is that you already know how to do a lot of this. Also realize this applies to both solo and tandem canoeing. Yeah, we don't leave anybody out. As with any activity, there's some jargon to learn. So if you come out to one of our symposiums, you'll pick it up very quickly. It's easier to ask questions if you know the buzzwords. First thing to realize is that every maneuver has three basic parts, that's all. Initiation is how you start the turn, which could be a J or a sweep. Placement is where you put the paddle blade. Conclusion wraps it up. It's usually a draw or a sweep. Heel and pitch, of course, are for enhancing the turns. These parts may not be familiar to most, and they take a little getting used to. Now let's take a close look at two maneuvers. The axle is a turn to the onside, to your paddling side. You initiate with the J, slice the blade forward into a static bow draw position. You hold that and let the turn happen. Takes a few seconds, you gotta hold it. Just let it ride. Conclude then with a draw to the bow. A wedge is a turn to the offside away from your paddling side. Starts with a forward sweep to initiate the turn. Slice to the bow and place the blade in the bow jam position that you might already know. Let the turn happen. You hold that position, let, let the turn happen and then concl conclude with another forward sweep. Func functional and interpretive freestyle canoeing. I know what you're thinking, you're saying, what, there are two kinds of freestyle canoeing? You bet. Functional is what we do in our everyday paddling. We're looking at quiet, efficient maneuvers that get us where we're going with minimal effort. We make use of these freestyle canoe maneuvers. Anytime, anytime you're traveling on a lake or a river, it's good for decompressing after work. And there's the interpretive side. This is the extreme sports version. Paddling to music creates a quiet state of mind. And then you start <clears throat> using the linked maneuvers and then a familiar passage comes up in the music and you, you know what this transition is coming up in the music and you hit a maneuver right on that phrase. You're literally dancing with your canoe now. Remember that healing the boat down to one side, if you heal that boat all the way down to the rail, which not many people do, and pitch one end of the boat down into the water, this enhances the turns to the extreme. 360 degree turns are possible. So let's take a look at paddling with music. It's much more fun than I expected it to be. When I first saw interpretive freestyle, I thought, well, okay, the song and dance is nice, but I just wanna know how to make my canoe do that because it looks like fun. And at some point I realized that, yeah, adding the music makes it even more fun.
find that having good skills opens up a lot of possibilities. You'll be able to go almost anywhere effortlessly, quietly. You'll see more wildlife as the animals won't hear you coming from a quarter mile away. You'll learn to love your canoe and everybody on shore will be asking, how did you do that? And now we'd be happy to take any questions you may have.